in our life journey, are we thriving or are we just surviving? Are the traumas and sins of our past holding us back? Do we truly believe that the Lord takes delight in us even in our brokenness? Today, join us as we answer those questions and more with Heather Kim, author of the book, Abiding, A Pathway to Transformative Healing and Intimacy with Jesus. I'm Father Dave Pavanka, and I'm president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Please stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavanka, and I'm president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, and we're talking today about healing and transformation in Christ. I'm joined by our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon, professor of biblical theology in the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. We're pleased to welcome today our guest, Heather Kim, Heather is the co-founder of Life Restoration Ministry in British Columbia. She's the co-author and internationally popular Abiding Together uh, podcast and the author of the book, Abide, A Pathway to Transformative Healing and Intimacy in Jesus, which we will be discussing today. Welcome, Heather. Thank you so much. Heather and I have known each other for a long time, but maybe just to be able to tell uh, a little bit about yourself and I'll actually kind of chime in and say what's what's true and what's not true. <laughs> okay, a little bit nervous about that. Yeah, yeah we, we've got stories. We do, yeah. So I, I live in British Columbia and I have a ministry there. Um, I went to school here, which yeah. is how we met. Indeed. And um, yeah, I have three children, all teenagers, which is just an amazing <laughs> season of life. It's my favorite. I think I've said that about every stage, but this really is really a favorite. So That's cool. Yeah. Maybe a little bit about your ministry. You and your husband, Jake, are a part of that. So maybe just share a little bit about that. Yeah, we really are trying to help awaken and restore disciples to Jesus, to their real identity as sons and daughters, and um, so that they can live the full life. That's the hope. And so we do that through events and accompaniment and teaching. And um, yeah, it's a, just a wonderful opportunity for us. To okay, so together. go back to the day that you were married and I was there. Yes. Was this your guys your plan? Was it always your plan? Your always vision? You saw yourself doing ministry together like this? How did it come about? That was the hope is that we would be in some kind of ministry together. I don't think we knew exactly the path it would take. My heart has always burned like for evangelization and to share the gospel. Um, but it kind of unraveled. It was like God was planting things and they came to be, you know, so even at our wedding, Isaiah 61 was mm -hmm. kind of our anchoring scripture. And just the way that that has turned out in our ministry, that that really is what we're about, is helping to restore people and set captives free to participate well, in Jesus' work. I mean, without putting you on the spot, Father, how does Father Dave figure uh, in your life story? Were, th were you classmates or? Oh, no. whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Off by he 10 was, years. <laughs> were you doing campus ministry yeah. when I was here? Yeah, so oh, he was wow. a fairly new priest, and so he just happened to be around a lot, available to go hang out, you know, with us as yeah. students. And then I ended up doing their wedding, oh, which, was, which was really yeah. a great blessing. You were assistant to the president at that point, weren't you? Uh, actually, I was probably in the conference office, working, okay. running the conferences at yeah. the time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of this moved you um, to write the book. Kind of what, what stirred in your heart to be able to write Abide, and, and why did you think this is necessary at this time? Yeah, it's funny because I never thought I would ever write a book that wasn't really on my mind or something to do until I was approached and asked, you know, what would you want to write about? And this is what came up instantly because this is what my heart really burns for. And it's coming from my own journey and my husband Jake and I, our own story, and just experiencing the radically transforming power of God in our life that has healed and restored places that we thought were lost, you know, and there was no way mm -hmm. through it. And just that burning desire to share that with people. It reminds me of uh, Dr. Bob Schutz, who was one of the endorsers, but yeah. you know, the way you integrate good theology and at the same time, interpersonal connectedness. I mean, he's a trained mm -hmm. psychologist, but um, it just seemed to me to be right to the heart. Reminds mm -hmm. me of Kimberly too, you know, a lot of anecdotes, but above all, it, it just takes people from professing their faith to experiencing it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had asked me a question actually early on when I we were talking about the book and you said, is it in you? And it was just a that question really stuck with me the whole time that I was writing it. I kind of came back to that question, is this what's in me? And I thought, this is everything I want to say mm -hmm. to people mm -hmm. about who God is, about, you know, of course, I can elaborate on it, you know, beyond the book. But but yeah, at the heart of it, this is what I hope that people yeah. would know. Do you know what really struck me about, about your book? Uh, initially, of course, it was the cover that leaps out. It's instantly captivating. It's very attractive. This is good. This is a great endorsement. <laughs> I love this. He yeah. just doesn't love all colors. <laughs> Arresting image. And then one of the first blurbs at the very beginning of the book, uh, which really uh, astounded me. Uh, I don't know who wrote it, but uh, uh, you really should have it patented uh, and, and use it as a marketing uh, strategy. But she pretty much says that every one of your words somehow extends the saving ministry and mercy of Jesus himself mm -hmm. on every page, which is pretty much like a sacrament, mm -hmm. you know, something instituted mm -hmm. by God uh, to convey grace. And yet the book itself confirms that insight. I mean, that, that, it's, a t it's a tall order. You, you set the standard, the bar, pretty darn high. Uh, and yet you pull it off. It's an amazing book. It really is comforting. It's a source of great hope, I think, for people if they walk through it and, and let those images soak into, into their souls, especially as you weave together the story of your life and then the lives of your family, your daughter uh, and your father in particular. Really quite moving stuff. Mm -hmm. And your older brother, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, uh, yeah. you know, readability is certainly a feature, but at the same time, approachability, so that you're reading this and you realize that you have traveled a path as a cradle Catholic that's probably similar to several million others, you know. Mm -hmm. some, you, you use the expression white knuckling through, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, when they read that, will be disarmed, like, yeah, that's me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really is, you know, there's a certain heroic element to grit and determination where you're not feeling close to Jesus, you're not feeling much of anything that's positive, but you just keep persevering. But eventually you just have to break out of the clouds and find the sky, you know, the sky and the, yeah. and the sun and, yeah. and that's what you got. Yeah, and I think Heather that that's what you do is you're able to share your story. So just that process of, of being able to share your story and share what the Lord has done in your life, was that something that comes naturally to you? Is it your desire to just make yourself open and available? I mean, what's that process like for you? I'm actually a very shy person. And I, I mean, thank God I took an acting class. And <laughs> not that I'm acting, but you know, there's certain things that I have to step into now because of what God has called me to in order to share the gospel with people. And no, I, I would prefer not to get in front of people and talk about the, you know, the details of my life. But at the same time, the only reason I can share those things that were at a time so painful is because of what God has done. It, it's not difficult to share the good things that God has done in, in the wreckage of life that, that occurs for all of us. So, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, some of the most intimate details of, of that life you unearth, uh, and really at, at, at one level, they're pretty unspeakable, horrible stuff mm -hmm. happened to you. It's not as if you're hiding behind the description because the description is transparent. It's a medium you know, mm -hmm. through which people are invited to see and to share exactly what happened. Like that story, when you look at your 11 year old daughter mm -hmm. and suddenly you're flooded with memories of what happened to you at age 11. Yeah. I mean, do you, would you mind talking about that? Sure. Because that's really, uh, that's shattering stuff. Yeah. I, and you know, I think we all have places, it, it doesn't matter how extreme or whatever for us, it's our experience exactly. that, I mean, I, I learned that early on. I felt like I was always diminishing my story um, and was so disconnected from it that I just thought, well, I have good parents and I have it better than most people. So it was easy right. to just dismiss it and diminish it. But we all have places in our story where we're incredibly hurting and broken mm. and we need the light of Jesus to come into those places. And so when I was growing up, yes, I was in a Catholic family and all of that, but there's a lot of trauma that occurred. I had a brother that passed away and my older brother was there when it happened. So he was, of course, dealing with all kinds of difficulty himself. And he went down a path to deal with that, a path that, that led him into a deep place of darkness. And he got involved in the occult. And 
Um, and I was the younger sister. And so I took the brunt of a lot of that, you know, emotional and spiritual abuse. And it was his pain that was coming out. It doesn't you do justify, that, right? yeah, it doesn't justify what he did, you know, but, but I can understand it as an adult, what was going on. But to be the recipient of that as a young child, you know, to be so afraid and to experience darkness at that level. And my life was threatened, you know, on a regular basis. I was just absolutely trapped in fear, you know, for a long, long time. Through something like Ouija board, you know, yeah. that was a that was a reminder to me that you don't even dabble. No. You don't even open the door a crack, mm -hmm. you know, because what comes in, you won't see. And then years later, you'll find out that it was all darkness. And but I mean, it was heartbreaking uh, to read that mm -hmm. account because mm -hmm. you, you were uh, plunged into a kind of fear uh, that rendered you silent. You couldn't share this even with your mother with whom you were otherwise so close. The yeah. dumb devil had somehow triumphed mm -hmm. uh, and you were a victim for at least a couple of years. You couldn't sleep at night and you kept this to yourself. Nobody knew. Yeah, I, and I think many of us do. Mm -hmm. Many of us do keep our suffering and our traumas quite close to us and many people don't know what's going on yeah. underneath the surface. And yeah, I mean, specifically, I, I was silenced and and yet, look at what God is doing, yeah. not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's one of the things that, that's important is that you talk about everybody's got a story in one way or another, mm -hmm. and, and we, we react to it differently, but ultimately what the book is about is, yes, you, you speak about the darkness, you speak about the brokenness, but you celebrate the healing so that the Lord enters into that. So maybe speak to that. How is it that, that the Lord began to bring the healing and give you a voice and, and bring you out of that sense of being trapped? Yeah, well, a couple of years after that, I was at a youth conference somewhere and there was just some beautiful people there, but this stuff started to come out, you know, and I had people pray with me and there was restoration that ha began to happen in my relationship with my brother that was really beautiful and he was coming out of this stage and a, a friendship began. So that in and of itself is, a, is right. miraculous. Um, but it wasn't until years later because usually for, for all of us, there are places of hurt and trauma that occur, but it's what are the lies and the beliefs that we have as a result of those yeah. uh, that carry through? And, th and that was the deeper healing that I needed to experience. So for me, the lie that I believe was that as I was there in my bed, afraid and crying out to God, that he was just watching from a distance yeah. and that he yeah. wouldn't come. And so throughout my life, that lie just was taking root and weaving all underneath the foundation of my life. Um, to where I really became so self-reliant that I didn't think God would come through. And so as my responsibilities increase and I have children and marriage and a ministry and all of these different things, I mean, I was being crushed by the weight of, uh, of everything that I was carrying. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really needed to seek the Lord and His healing because it came out even physically. I started to, you know, experience just a lot of anxiety. Yeah. And, uh, and that's when I really began to go way down to the deep, mm -hmm. way down. And even now, you know, I'm in a new place where I'm going way down <laughs> to the deep. And it's, I always, I feel like I'm staring into the abyss again. And yet Christ is so close to me there. And yeah, yeah, he's so That's close. That's the difference, right? Is that the yeah. sense is that the Lord's inviting you down there. It's not a place of being trapped or a place of being alone, but the Lord's leading. That's not to say yeah. that it's always easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and that's, that's the overall healing that's occurring is that, and I say this in the book, the goal isn't really healing. The goal is intimacy with Jesus. And the more that we allow him into these places of our heart where we're trapped, broken, lost, the prisoner and allow him to set us free, the intimacy grows. So now as I face this new abyss that I'm staring into, he's closer. I'm, my, the sense that I have is he's closer than ever before. And I, I just became aware of this, this artist who built this statue called Christ in the Abyss in the 1950s and it's in Italy and it's like 50 feet down in the ocean. And it's this image of Christ with his arms, you know, in the air just reaching up and, it, and there at the bottom is a section of Psalm 139 where it says, even if I go to the depths, mm -hmm. he's there. Mm -hmm. No matter how deep we go into the darkness, he's deeper still. You know, I'm glad you testify to the fact that it isn't like I've retired from hardship so I can do ministry. <laughs> I, I, I wish, I, I, right. wish exactly. I wish, I wish I Because once you're doing ministry, it is just you're on a roll, you yeah. know? Well, no, you're not. I mean, you, yeah. you still have darkness. And in a few years, you might be able to look back and then share the wisdom that you acquired from that. Because, it's I mean, at, at 65, I must admit, I feel totally inadequate 
And our Lord doesn't say, oh no, you're super adequate. I mean, he is our adequacy. That's right. And that's what you're testifying to. And even when the, the feelings of his closeness vanish, and they do, I mean, look mm -hmm. at Mother Teresa. Of course. Yeah. Uh, in a certain sense, that is an invitation to deeper intimacy. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like, stop kissing me so much as Mother Teresa, yeah. you know, yes. heard from people about the cross. Yeah. It, it's really the experience of Jesus uh, the night before he, he, he dies. The Gethsemane ordeal, the anguish of the absence of the Father. He mm -hmm. perceives only the presence of an absence. Where are you? He cries out and he wants this terrible chalice of suffering uh, to pass him by, but mm -hmm. he submits in, in, in sheer sort of he sort of white knuckles it, I, I think, at that moment. Uh, he soldiers through, powers through, you know, consigning himself to the inscrutable will of the Father that I have to endure this, this darkness. And that's what brings light uh, to the world, that he goes so deep that you and I are able to climb out mm -hmm. and climb so high. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And part of it is also, I think, that you've experienced the Lord's faithfulness. You've experienced his presence. You've experienced him journeying. So, the, the thought of going into the abyss again is not something one necessarily looks forward to in one sense, mm -hmm. but even on a, on a mystical sense, maybe, but that you know that the Lord is going to be there, that he's going to lead you, he's not going to abandon you. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I mean, that image of Thomas putting his fingers yeah. into the side of Christ. I was sitting with that one day and I felt the opposite, you know, where I had the wound and Jesus was putting his hand into yeah. the wound. And at first I was like, ah, like this is so, don't do that, you know. And he said, don't be afraid. My hands are here to heal. Amen. Not There's to an hurt. act of trust there. Yeah. Let's stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment. It is vitally important that we re-engage with what we think we already know about the story of God and open our hearts to hear it again with new ears and find out the new things God wants to reveal to us. Abide a pathway to transformative healing and intimacy with Jesus by Heather Kim. Walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. You'll explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage in the Holy Land, Poland, France, Austria, Italy, and more destinations. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. As we grow in compassion for ourselves, we realize our poverty and need for God instead of self-hatred and shame that leads us into isolation. Abide, a pathway to transformative healing and intimacy with Jesus by Heather Kim. And welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're discussing healing and transformation and living a life full in Christ as we seek a deeper intimacy with Jesus, and we seek uh, the blessing and the graces that come to us in Lent. So, Heather, you, you've talked a little bit about the brokenness in, in that, that abyss, but, but the danger might be to just kind of get stuck there. The reality is, is the Lord wants us to live life, live it abundantly, live it to the full. Mm -hmm. Maybe speak to that. A, a danger is just to focus on, on that, but that, the goal is actually that fullness, right? Yeah, I mean, this is what Jesus has promised. He said in John 10, 10, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. Not just survive. Not, not just, you know, live a mediocre existence yeah, 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 yeah. And, and not white knuckle it. We were referring to that earlier. Like he really did come that we would have life to the full. And what does that mean? You know, what does that actually mean? There's a phrase that you used to say sometimes, you know, that's not the kind of God we have. And it set me on this journey of, well, what is the kind of God we have? What is he like? What does he desire for us? What does it look like to live a life with this, mm -hmm. with this man who was so captivating that, that caused people to just walk away from everything that yeah, they knew, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so I, I think as we enter into these places of darkness in our, in our life, it's with that hope that this is going to lead to the fullness of life, even though there is suffering, even though the point, is, it, the point isn't the removal of pain and that it all goes away. That's not reality mm -hmm. here on earth. That's going to be the reality in heaven. But not only is it not a reality, you, you share in the book that those become the stumbling blocks for us. They become the obstacles yeah. to be able to leave that. So maybe speak to that. If you think of some of these obstacles you mentioned, maybe half a dozen of them, but what are one, of the, one or two of those obstacles that really jump out at you? Yeah, I had mentioned diminishment. I think a lot of us diminish the things in our story. We can say things like, you know, know, well, that happened for, I just got to get over it. I just got over it. And it's not as bad as. It's not as bad as someone else. Yeah. You know, we, we diminish those things. I think another one is living sort of a practical atheism where we, 
we don't actually believe that God is who he says he is when it comes to our story. I might believe it for you or yeah. for other people, but when it comes to my story, I don't believe God can do it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, maybe just back to that dimension, because I think that's important, is, is even people watching could say, well, her story, that's not mine. And, and the number of people I've had say to me over the years is, this isn't a big deal, but, and I'm thinking like, <laughs> you're, you're 55 years old and you're talking about an event that happened when you were nine. Right. Maybe yeah. it is a big deal, right? <laughs> yeah. But a permission right. to be able to have that. Yeah. 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 I mean, those stories loom large uh, in your life, uh, and I think you have the courage uh, to confront them uh, and the honesty to speak uh, the truth about what they meant. And at the deepest level, Jesus was there who wanted to beckon you, summon you uh, to a fuller life, a life of sheer, superabounding joy. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me as if you've seized upon that uh, and you've, you've, you've gotten that blessing, uh, but you haven't forgotten uh, where you, you came from, mm -hmm. what you never really left behind, but somehow integrated uh, and inserted into, into this much larger fabric. I mean, there's a bigger story, the story that you and Jesus are telling mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. and the outcome is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. Well, I, I think of it also as being somewhat sobering, yet reassuring. Sobering in the sense that uh, people read it, they're like, she was raised in a pretty good Catholic family. Mm -hmm. She had hard times. And yet, look at what she's describing in terms of brokenness. What hope do others have who don't yeah. have a strong Catholic family? A father who loves them, goes to Mass, sacraments, and all of that, you know. It's reassuring, though, because it isn't just because your parents ended up figuring out what was wrong and they cleaned up the mess. Mm -hmm. It was really a kind of unveiling where the curtain is pulled back, and you had to discover the Father, That's and you had to enter into a relationship with Jesus. And so... You know, no matter what kind of family you have, if it's really strong and apparently holy, brokenness. Mm -hmm. If yes. your family is broken, brokenness, you know. Yes. And in both instances and the whole across the whole spectrum, you know, God is scripting our lives in a way that is utterly inscrutable. You know, you talk about how he called these men to follow him and, and he was irresistible, he was so attractive, and yet he was also at many points bewildering. Mm -hmm. You know, incomprehensible, where the disciples over and over again don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, I just think of how many times I've been embarrassed by the disconnect between Jesus and me, even while I've just gone into a class to lecture about yeah, exactly. Christology or, or scripture. Write a, write a great book about it. Right. Right? And I think, honestly, Heather, that's one of the things you do really beautifully is, is take the lived experience and actually the gospel begins to take flesh mm. with that, you know. Um, but you, you haven't done this alone. So m maybe a word how you and Jake did this together as a couple and, and, and you walked and you journeyed and you brought about this, this fullness of life in, in that in, as a family and as a couple. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true that we can often just live life on the surface. You know, we live it from our head. We live that, yeah, I believe this, I assent to this, or we use our will to activate things. But but really to, to have our life overlaid by the gospel and by the whole entire story that's going on, that God is writing this beautiful story and our story fits in, you know, like what happened in Eden, what happened in... in um, Gethsemane and Golgotha, this is happening within our own hearts, within our own stories. And what Jesus wants to do is exactly what he did when he rose. He, he wants to do that here. I and, want to just jump in just yeah. real quick, because as soon as you said that, that one of the things you talk about is these lies. As soon as you said that, my what went through my mind and heart was that there are people who are listening that are saying, God is not writing a beautiful story in my life. They just don't yeah. believe that. So maybe speak yeah. to that. Yeah. And I, and I think if that's what people are believing right now, that's the enemy writing that story. Right. You know, yeah. God is writing a story and sometimes we can't hear it, we can't see it because the voice of the enemy and the narrative that he's been writing throughout our story is so loud within our own minds and hearts that we can't hear. Right. We can't hear what God is saying and what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And so that's the unraveling of the lies and you know, this book has a lot of practical things in it because I want people to be able to go, well, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Here's a few mm -hmm. tools mm -hmm. that can help you and you can come back to them to start unraveling what are the lies, what happened? What are the messages that I received early on? And what's the truth of God? Mm -hmm. And in his word and scripture that he wants to speak into those yeah, very like personal the places. Say, the, the enemy says this and God says this. Yeah. That Just that one page was really great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is one particular chapter in your story that uh, is really 
pretty depressing uh, when you discover that your husband yeah. has been fixated on porn yeah. for such a long time yeah. and suddenly uh, the catastrophe of a marriage uh, looms before you. Is it all over? Can That's I trust right. this man ever again? That's right. I mean, that was the low point, I would think. And yet, nowadays, you might almost say it was sort of good. I mean, this, this was a, a, a Felix Culpa, a happy fault, because yes. look, what, look what Grace was able to make of this. I mean, Hopkins has a beautiful image about grace that it rides time like a river. It doesn't hover above the surface or the flux. It penetrates right down to the bottom. Yeah. Uh, and everything is somehow transfigured by this healing grace of Jesus. And in the case of your husband, it, it, it certainly took place, this yes. surgical transmutative uh, uh, effort on the part of grace to change his life and yes. to change your marriage. Yes, and I mean, that's astonishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just a little bit more about that story. You know, we were married here, we were both students, we were in ministry, we were in relationship with God and just so excited, you know, to be married. And, and I went into this thinking, this is amazing. And, and it was in many ways. And what I didn't know was that Jake had this deep wound from a very young age, you know, from from things he never should have been exposed to at an early age that ended up in this addiction that I didn't know that he was hiding. And, and we do that. We hide the things that we're so ashamed of. You know, it wasn't to hurt me, but, but it did. You know, when it finally came out, it was absolutely devastating. I just felt my heart like fall into my shoes. And, you showed and a I thought- the image of holding the baby that night on the couch. It was yeah. just a beautiful, yeah. just how the Lord Yeah, we had a new that. daughter. I mean, I just thought, really? And this is where the, you know, the suggestion from the enemy comes in. This is what God had for me. This was right. the promise. Right. Really? You know, and that's, those things can seep deep into our hearts and the pain becomes worse. Yeah. But this is where the rubber meets the road also in my life. This was the first yeah. experience that I said, Lord, either you have to come in and do something that we cannot do, which is heal and restore something so incredibly broken or we're lost. Yeah. And I think the temptation for him to withhold that information yeah. must have been almost overpowering. Yeah. He, he, and yet he, he comes out and speaks the truth. The truth is always purifying. Yes. It clarifies everything. But until you speak it, uh, the devil, I think, has the upper hand. You, you've got to make that dumb demon speak uh, yeah. and, and reveal uh, what's, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And you just spoke to it, and you speak of it in the book, is that, you know, part of he was operating out of his brokenness and well. And, and I agree that it's not an excuse, right? But it is the reality. And in my experience has been that so oftentimes the case. And in marriage, it's, God bless you guys that get married, yeah, but it's it's two broken people yeah. trying to live together, and yeah. Yeah. which is somewhat comical, but. Yeah. And the story for many people right now is, well, in the area of, let's use pornography as an example, it's so common. Yeah. You just have to deal with it probably. And that's what a priest said to me at that time. And I just wanted to take my phone I was talking to him on and throw it out the window and say, don't ever say that to me. Right. Because the power of God has to be real in yeah, these areas of our life to set us free. Or what are we doing? Wow. This this will lead to us, yes, yeah. white knuckling through the rest yeah. of our life. And you talk and, about the, re the power of the resurrection, that that's not just yes. something in the future. That was something there that day yes. at that moment. For yes. You. And it took time. You know, there was many, many days of weeping in a church, you know, singing my prayer to God to come and heal me. It was not an easy Path. And for Jake as well, he had to learn to be self-disciplined. He needed to be healed. He needed sure. to go to counseling, you know, all of those practical things because we do need help along the way. Well, that phrase you used earlier about a practical atheism, I, I think that is so telling. In, in fact, for a lot of people, it's as if God didn't exist, or if he does, he's pretty limited. Mm -hmm. There's only so much he can do. That's right. I mean, what kind of a God is that? I mean, that yeah. sounds like a salesman. That's right. you know, I can sell only so many, so many products, but right. here's a market I can't reach. I mean, who wants a God like that? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, that's great. That's you know, I, I, I come back to the sense that I think all of us have at a deep level that when we're getting close to God or when he's entering our lives, he's doing so in order to exempt us from that kind of brokenness. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't ever happen that way. You know, even if you're one of the 12, you're still going to stumble. But I mean, I love the way gospel characters are introduced, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the leper, the hemorrhaging woman, you know, and all of the times that Jesus is reaching out and touching people, you know, the disciples are like, oh, this is really great, you know. On the other hand, what they really need to learn is, that's me. Yeah. I'm not a leper per se, and yet, you know, likewise, I'm not paralyzed, and yet my sin does exactly that in my relationship to God. And so the idea of resurrection, initiating healing and restoration, 
-hmm. So it's not just a healing so you're let, you know, let out of the hospital. It's to restore that relationship so that you can not only abide with Christ in a way that is intimate, but you can be the conduit Mm -hmm. you know, the channel as you've become, and I'm sure Jake as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think many of us, you know, as Catholics, we have an understanding of carrying our cross. And it's beautiful, and we have this theology around redemptive suffering, and it's so incredibly beautiful. But many of us, I think, fall into another trap where we're just walking around in circles with our cross. And right. we just talk yeah. about this is heavy, this is hard, this is right. this excruciating, is this is, right, this is right. what it is, I'm, I'm just carrying my cross. And, and a part of me, you know, just wants to go, where? where are you carrying it? Like, are you going to carry it up that hill so that you can die on it and then experience the resurrection of Jesus? Because that's where he went and we're supposed to be followers of Jesus. Right. And, and that invitation is so painful when we hear it from the Lord. Like, will you come and die with me here? And everything in us wants to say, absolutely not. Right. You know, this is the better way is to, the better way is to just sit here in the midst of this pain. And Jesus says, but on the other side is new life. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the question is whether or not you believe or have experienced that there actually is another side because yeah. it's profoundly dark if we don't believe that there is, that this all it is. So yeah. we'll be right back with more Francis University Presents. Please stay with us. We are so convinced that doing it our way and doing it ourselves is best. But Jesus is the only one who has defeated death and risen from the grave. And he is the only one who can resurrect the dead and the broken places in us. Abide, a pathway to transformative healing and intimacy with Jesus by Heather Kim. When you see the world through a Catholic lens, you see God's hand at work in human history. You see the true, the good, the beautiful. Franciscan University of Steubenville's Master of Arts in Catholic Studies is an online program that offers courses in literature, biology, art, theology, psychology, all taught from a distinctively Catholic perspective so you can see the world with Catholic eyes. Find out more about the Masters in Catholic Studies. Go to franciscan.edu slash mcs. Welcome back and thanks for joining us. You're watching Franciscan U University Presents, which we record here in the Com Arts Studio at Franciscan University in Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment and our theology professors, Dr. Martin and Dr. Hahn and I are discussing the book, Abide, A Pathway to Transformative Healing and Intimacy with Jesus with our author and friend, Heather. Uh, Heather, you talk a lot about the images of God and the images of Jesus and the Father. Maybe speak more to that. How is it that 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 needs to be transformed, that that needs to be healed. Mm -hmm. I think many of all of us have images of God that just aren't true, you know, that come from our story or come from experiences or come sometimes from what people tell us, uh, bad witnesses mm -hmm. in the church or otherwise uh, that, that disfigure the face of God. And in the catechism, it talks about this. I think it's 239 where it says, you know, mother and father are the first representatives yeah, yeah. of God for man and they disfigure the face of God. And then it goes on to say, but no one is father like God is Father, and God wants to restore that. So I think often we can look at Jesus and be like, oh, you know, he's like a police officer and he's looking to make, like, catch me in my mistakes, or, or maybe he's just like the genie in the bottle that I ask for wishes right, right, and, right. and I want him to give me what I want, what I've asked for, and when he doesn't, then I can shake my fist at him. Right. Um, and we don't know that he's the loving father, that he's the friend, that he's the savior, that, that he wants to be the lover that comes into these intimate places of our heart to restore us there. And yeah, so you, you would think that uh, the first line of the creed would disabuse people of that. I believe in one God, Father Almighty. And there's not even a comma between <laughs> yeah. those two words. Yeah. So you've got the proximity of absolute power and absolute paternity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a perfect combination. That's the kind of father I think we all pine for. Yeah. You know, and it's significant that father comes before almighty, you know, because that subordinates the power to paternity. Uh, and yet it doesn't disabuse, I mean, it doesn't cause things to vanish because, you know, disfiguring the face of the father, you know, I have to admit that at points, if you study the life of Jesus, or if you study the history of Israel, or if you just reflect upon your own experience, you're like, I'd never father my kids this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd never permit them, much less call them or command them to endure rejection, betrayal, torture, execution, this kind of, you know, I, I hate to say it, I hesitate, but you know, if God were a sadist, would things look much different? Of mm -hmm. course they 
they would, and yet at the same time, so much of what he does in calling us to endure rejection, betrayal, you know, we were talking in the last segment about the cross. You know, I remember within the last five years enduring something that just wouldn't go away, mm. a sense of abandonment, betrayal, and that kind of thing. And I would walk up towards the friary where that big steel cross mm. is and try to hug it mm. at night when it was totally dark, you know, and nobody was there. And I'm just like, my cross is too big for me to carry, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's crushing me. And I felt like our Lord was just saying, you know, put it on me. I carried it, you know, and I'm like, it'll crush you. You know, but he just said, I, I've been there, I've yeah, been crushed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just, you, there's a radical identification with Christ right. that transfigures the face of the Father, yeah. where you realize it isn't how much he knuckled through the, you know, Golgotha or right, the Via Della Rosa. It's the love that he maintained that transformed the pain into passion. The, the suffering becomes a sacrifice of love. So the love that he gives us endows the suffering that he calls us to into something that is truly an expression of love and a purification right. of and love. That's, I think that's the transformative part that in the midst of our suffering, and it's really what you invite us to, Heather, is in the midst of that, we find Jesus who has loved us from the beginning mm -hmm. and wants to rescue us. I mean, literally rescue us in the midst of that. And But again, that that's a huge step that maybe even listeners and viewers hear us speaking of this. But that's like that's a step of faith. Maybe speak. How how do you help somebody make that step? That just to be able to hear this, it's like okay, well that's great for you, mm -hmm. but how do you help somebody make that step? Yeah, I think for me, just getting into scripture for real has helped me understand who Jesus really is. And praying like God, help me to see you like who you really are, instead of just opening you know the pages up randomly. But get into the Gospels and see what Jesus was like, and see what would it be like to be there and to listen to him, and how did they respond to him? You know, this is a compelling figure that I think, what was his personality like that people would just drop everything to follow him? I mentioned that earlier, but really I can't get away from that point. Mm -hmm. But I talk about in the book too, the experience of Peter where I often feel like I'm Peter and I've betrayed the Lord and I've I've just blown it completely. <laughs> and, and yet Jesus comes to him so tenderly and even makes him a meal, you know, on the beach, like just taking care of every need. And as Peter comes to meet Jesus, I, I mean, I can't imagine that he just stood there yeah. waiting for Peter to get to him. Like, I, I just think, no, I mean, the way that his personality is, he would have rushed out into the water to meet him there. Yeah. Um, but these are things that I, I believe every one of us can uncover. Jesus wants to come into the dark places. That's what, that's the hope of the scripture. We see him, he reaches out to the man, the young man who's dead on the stretcher. He's mm -hmm. not afraid to get close. He's not afraid to get close to the woman at the well. Right. These are all of us, you yeah. know, and he's drawn to the brokenhearted, drawn to the little one. I feel incredibly little these mm -hmm. days mm -hmm. and and I've never been closer mm -hmm. to him as well. Yeah, the, the point that really survives the telling of Peter's uh, denial is not that he experiences and feels this depth of sheer denial, but that Jesus' forgiving love is deeper than even the denial, that he can work with that and, and transform it if Peter will accept what he's done. Sort of like the story you tell, well, retell uh, from uh, the Chronicles of Narnia uh, mm -hmm. in your book, the, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Mm -hmm. Eustace, he's really a brat. Yeah. I mean, you describe yeah. him as bratty and a bully, and that's entirely true. He's mm -hmm. insufferable, and, and he's also greedy, covetous, uh, and he ends up in that cave, and he falls asleep with, with uh, the gold uh, bracelet round his wrist, and then he wakes up and discovers he's completely covered uh, uh, as a dragon, and nobody can peel it off, but Aslan can, who's really the analog for Christ, mm -hmm. but he's got to put him in the water. Mm -hmm. And then even when he emerges, there, there are still stains that only the claw of this lion can, yes. can break free. And it's painful, it's bloody painful, and he cries out, but that pain is salutary. He has to experience it. Mm -hmm. it it's very much like the story that Lewis tells in The Great Divorce. You know, the character who's got the lizard on his on his shoulder and doesn't want to let go because they've they've become companionable for so long, mm -hmm. and and the lizard promises, look, I'll leave you alone from time to time, but don't don't make don't make me go. And the angel offers to snatch it and mm -hmm. toss it away, but he resists until finally he blurts out, take it, kill it, and it's 
indescribably painful mm -hmm. when this archangel grabs hold of the lizard and flings it to the ground, and then it reemerges as this yeah. stallion, which he can then ride, and there they go into the sunset. Yeah. Yeah. And, and only heaven. good things come from pain. The best things come through pain. Yeah. We see that in the world everywhere. Athletes, you know, Mother Teresa, the, the lives of the saints. This, these are the people that we look up to, and we desire this deep in our heart because that's the full life. It's the mix of joy and suffering all in one, and that we're willing to keep going, you know, keep going through the process. But many of us, just in our fear, we're paralyzed and we stay still and we never live. And it's counter you know? counterintuitive. That yeah. Stuff and faith. Yeah. I mean, at, I think at the part end of the problem is that that we want to do that on our terms, right, yeah. and on our exactly. timeline, exactly. you know, exactly. and for our goals. And so when God intrudes, when He just sort of butts into our lives and does things that just don't fit at all with our agenda. Mm. I think that, um, I mean, resentment might seem too strong of a word, but I don't think it is. I think that deep down, we don't just feel distance from God. We have resentment. And I think what you're also expressing there is uh, we need to be healed of that. We need to be able to say, God, you know, for a long time I was suspicious, but then it didn't go away, it got worse. Mm -hmm. I, I resented you. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if this is a father, you know, what part of that do mm -hmm. I want to have, you know? But as you go through the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering, and I think especially is that appropriate now in Lent, you know, because in some ways we can choose our mortifications in terms of prayer, fasting, almsgiving, giving up dessert or whatever. But there's a deeper kind of Lenten penance that recognizes, okay, I am not blessed with a great marriage, for example, or my kids are out of the church, or, you know, I find myself unable to connect with other people's stories that end up, that always end so wonderfully, you know. Mm -hmm. Just trust the Lord, you know, and express that trust in the darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was thinking about that, that it, so in many ways your book is a journey. It's a path and, and, it's, and it's leading you. That's what Lent does for us. But even in that, just trust in the Lord that, yes, of course, but I would love to have a dollar for every time somebody came to confession and said, I just don't trust the Lord. And, and how foolish it sounds to, for me to say, I don't trust the Lord. Oh, that's foolishness. But it is ultimately what it's about. Mm -hmm. You you seem to, in, in these experiences that you share and the transformation and the encounters, it, it has to come about through prayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does that look like for you? You're, you're a mother, you've got three teenagers, life is just so calm and peaceful, and, and you know, <laughs> yes. what, is, what does that look like for somebody that's busy and life is busy? And because so much of what you're saying, I think really comes about because you have an intimacy with Jesus that comes through prayer. Yeah. In, in this season, how do you help us with that? I'd love to say that I sit for an hour oh, in that's quiet. So fantastic. <laughs> you know, I, I really, depend on Jesus in the moment to moment. And I'm, I'm talking to him all throughout my day, you know, whether it be I'm in the car and there's music on that's prayerful and I'm trying to just like agree with the truth that is being sung in these songs, you know, that are coming from scripture. Or many times, to be honest with you, I'm standing in my kitchen in the middle of making food and I'm leaning over my counter and I'm just saying, Jesus. And that's all I can say right. over and over again. And even that, that there's power in his name, the catechism teaches us this, that it's the only name that contains the presence that it signifies. Like right. he yeah. truly is present as we just speak his name. He's so accessible actually. And I don't know if many of us know that yeah. or, or reach out to him in those moments where it's just, yeah, that is often my prayer life. It's like just saying his name and inviting him to come because I don't know what else to say. I can't muster up the right, words. Right, right, I don't right. know how to even ask for it. And, and this is how I want my kids to come to me as well. And I'm an imperfect parent. I love them desperately, but I know that I hurt them and I fail. But I want them to come to me with the things and say, you know, when you did this, it hurt me, or I didn't understand why you said this, or your, your tone seemed harsh, or whatever it is that we might too believe about God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That he wants us to come to him with these things relationally to say, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're doing. And it feels like you're far away and it feels like you don't love me. And to, to welcome the truth that he wants right, to, to say that I know it's not true, but this yeah. is what I'm Tell me the truth. Yeah, sometimes you know? it's really essential not to trust the feelings. Yes. Exactly. Because they're, I mean, they're treacherous. Yes. I mean, hope is a virtue and it's not located uh, in the emotions. It's not a, a, 
you know, a glandular movement. It's in the will, uh, and uh, that will can be sanctified. Uh, and you have to hope almost against hope. You trust in something you can't see, you can't measure. I mean, you can't take that to the bank. You can't see it. I don't even know if I'm going to be saved. I hope I will, but it's not a function of knowledge, mm -hmm. but hope, a, a kind of childlike expectancy that Jesus only wants good things for me. But when you're in the midst of the darkness, like Scott, that night you're hugging the cross mm. on campus. Beautiful. You don't see that the outcome is going to be happy. Mm -hmm. You don't feel it. I, I feel only an absence. And that, I think, makes you cling all the more desperately uh, to this desire that you have. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, where you realize it's not actually, what we need is not actually the resolution of whatever pain we're going through. It's Jesus. Yeah, that, That's what yes. we're longing for. That's, that's laser beam yeah. <laughs> precision. There's a fine line between not trusting Jesus and telling Jesus, I can't trust you. You know, because then it becomes the beginning of prayer. Mm -hmm. To me, the prelude to Jesus, I trust you is Jesus, I'm not I'm trusting having you. a hard time here. Yeah, yeah I don't it's trust honest. you. Yes. You know, and, and, and that's the end of resenting God, where you say, God, I'm resenting you because I can't see any sense in what you've allowed to happen. But once you turn away from just, and, and you have a great description in several places of where you're just turning in on yourself. And then there's a kind of invisible exodus where we come out of ourselves and we encounter God. And we can really be blunt and honest and humble. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Comes to my mind, you know. Mm -hmm. Jesus, obviously, when he's quoting Psalm 22, knows the answer to the question. Why is the Father forsaking me? Why is he allowing me to feel that forsakenness? It's for the redemption of the world. But you have to ask that question. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to say, why is it that you've put me in a situation where I can't seem to trust you. Mm -hmm. And let him tell us the truth. I right. mean, I think that's what we're lacking right now in the world is people that we can look to who are gonna tell us the truth. Like they're falling off the planet. You know, people right. who are trustworthy in leadership that we can look to who are gonna tell us what we need to know. And then we have scripture where God's word is telling us everything that is true. And yet we don't know how to access it or we don't know how to, you know, sit with it and let it seep into these places in our own hearts. And, and I think sometimes healing can become not really what it's about. It can become insular. We right, look right, interiorly right, right, right. and it becomes about my story and my pain and my things. And, and it's a fascinating word right now in the world and counseling and, you know, all the veils are coming off and people feel like they can enter into this arena. And yet often it's without Jesus there. Right. And it just becomes, it just I'm trying to, to heal Jesus. myself, right, right, right. you know, and I'm trying to just like come to grips with my own story. It's like, let's come to grips with the real story right. and then put our story up next to it and allow it to be transformed. And so many people, I think there's almost a guilt for them to come to that place that says, I'm not sure, you know what you're saying, I'm not positive, to, to actually, that's a, that question, God, who are you? Um, are you really trustworthy? I mean, that is the moment, right there is the moment of conversion for the individual yes. who can authentically ask that question, not worry about it, not seeing this, sounds like scandalous, but trust that the Lord is going to meet them in there. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Uh, next, our panel and our guests will give their final thoughts on healing and transformation of Christ. Please stay with us. You are glorious, chosen, royal, unrepeatable, and made by the hands of love himself, with the fingerprints of the Father upon you. There is never a better time for us to shed the false self than right now. Abide, a pathway to transformative healing and intimacy with Jesus by Heather Kim. There is a place where education begins and faith and reason connect. Franciscan University of Steubenville's online programs will advance your career through an e-learning experience that's both academically excellent and passionately Catholic. With online degrees taught by full-time professors in theology, catechetics, business, education, and other disciplines, you can earn your master's degree online without changing your lifestyle. Find out more today at franciscan.edu, where your faith and career can connect online. When we allow a desire for something good to be directed at something else for our own selfish pleasures, we will ultimately be left unsatisfied. We see this all throughout the scriptures and in the lives of each human being, but we also see conversion can happen. Abide, a pathway to transformative healing and intimacy with Jesus by Heather Kim.
And welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. Regis, your final thoughts? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, there are many thoughts uh, jostling about my, my brain, but one obvious uh, and salient thought is, is gratitude, thanksgiving for this really splendid book that you've, you've written. I mean, you've written it uh, out of your own life. It reflects uh, an experience which is pretty profound and, and not so unusual. I mean, everybody has experiences of pain, brokenness. I mean, Jesus came because we're bereft, we're broken. He didn't come uh, for the healthy. There aren't any healthy people with the exception of Mary. Everybody else is pretty sick. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and he's the divine physician, and you have to accept your condition. It's, it looks pretty hopeless from a secular point of view, but I'm here uh, to work miracles. And one miracle that uh, really uh, riveted my mm -hmm. attention was the one that took place uh, with your father. He, he's, mm -hmm. you know, he lays dying, he's stricken. It's pretty clear he's not gonna make it. In <laughs> fact, I kept expecting him <laughs> to, to sort of peg out, and yet, he has this prayer, this prayer of desperate desire, I, I think triggered by the encounter with the leper in the New Testament, and astonishingly, he's cured. Yeah. He's made well, and the next day, the cancer is gone. There's no evidence of it. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's a good outcome <laughs> of prayer. Not bad, huh? Yeah. You know, Father Benedict Grishel once, once uh, speculated about how Mary and, uh, and uh, John and the holy women of, of, of Jerusalem must have felt as they walk away from Good Friday. I mean, at some point they've got to leave town because he's dead, he's not with us anymore, and how crestfallen they must have felt. I mean, this was a catastrophe of, of major proportions. Everything had been invested in this guy. We had real skin in the game, and look, he's a loser. He turns out to be dead, this criminal, this felon, uh, who's never gonna come back. So you imagine that th that's the nadir. They've reached the very bottom of, 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 their, of their hope, and yet, Two days later, the guy bounces out because here is a God who knows how to climb out of the grave. And they're clinging by a fingernail of trust uh, to the promise that, that the Father has given them that I'm going to redeem even this. And he's able to do it. Which he does. Which he does. And your book testifies to that so beautifully. Thanks, Regis. Scott. Yeah, I mean, thank you for writing the book and for sharing your own life experience and drawing from culture, you know, not only... Uh, C.S. Lewis, or, but I mean, Hunger Games, and that kind of thing. One of the things that I got out of the book um, that I've been reflecting upon is um, how the ways of God are wonderful and yet weird. Yeah. They're weird. And I think the more we can confess that, mm. you know, looking at his face, the more he can work with us. You know, Jairus' daughter, you know, why did he delay? Lazarus, he's asleep. Well, he'll wake up. No, he's dead. Well, why did you say he's asleep? You know, Jesus is so inscrutable at times. It just borders on weirdness, you know. And yeah, it's frustrating. And it's probably meant to be. It isn't like Jesus saying, that frustrated you? I mean, he knows that, he, that it does. And so I, I think that we have in life a series of breakthroughs with our Lord that are many conversions, but are absolutely necessary as much as the initial repentance that brought us to him. And I think then that the healing that happens is not just to heal us from suffering or to heal us from illness, but to heal us from fear. That's what I got out of the book, mm -hmm. that I felt like our Lord was saying, Scott, I don't want to deliver you from suffering as much as I want to deliver you from the fear mm -hmm. of suffering, because yes. that paralyzes you more than whatever ailment you have. Yeah, that's great. And it's like, that is a nugget of yeah, gold, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so I'll thank take you. That. I'll yeah. take that. Right. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, Good. That's Heather, thank you so much for being here. Maybe your final thought. Yeah, you know, I, I get invited to speak at different places, and I have this podcast, you know, that mm -hmm. seems to reach a lot of people. And over and over again, I just wish that I could continue to say, don't be afraid mm -hmm. to people, just to echo the words of Christ, don't be afraid. Like, he sees us. He sees where we are in our poverty and in our littleness and our inability to trust and our inability to, to believe even. And so maybe that's just where we need to start is just to acknowledge I'm really little and to ask for the gift of faith. It is a gift that God gives to us. I've begged him for it many times, and he keeps coming through to just give me enough to get me through the next section. And, and I think that leads to trust, you know, faith in him, it leads to trust. And the more that we encounter him, the more we trust him. 
And so when we get to dark places, it might not turn out the way that we thought. It might be weird, you know, we might not understand, mm -hmm. but to still be able to say, I'm being healed by his presence right. being here with here. me in the midst. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about our topic, uh, we have a free handout for you. It's a short selection from Heather's book, Abide. This handbook is yours for free simply by going online to faithandreason.com slash presents or by calling the number we'll provide momentarily. Again, Heather, just want to thank you for your vulnerability, for your intimacy, for the example, for the witness that you have. Uh, one of the things that I, I think I take away is this, this invitation to trust in Jesus more, this invitation to come to understand that he is present for us. I recall a student, we were talking earlier about Gomming. I recall one time with the students in Gomming, we were in Salzburg and it was a cold afternoon, cold evening, and this one student, a uh, young female, didn't have a jacket. And this gentleman, one of our students, took off his jacket and put it around her shoulders. It was so lovely, right? It was so beautiful. And, and a student came back to me uh, the next day and she said, Father Dave, did you see that? And I said, yeah, I saw that. She goes, that never happens to me. I go, what do you mean? She goes, guys never put their jacket around my shoulders. And I said, well, you had a jacket on. I mean, why is it? And she goes, yeah, I'm not stupid. I'm not gonna go out without a jacket. But, but what, this came, what we came to understand is that she put herself in a position where she never had to count on anybody. Yeah. And, and, and that was her life. She lived her life in a way that she was never gonna have because of some of the things that have happened in her life, because people had not been faithful, because people had failed her, because people had abandoned her. She was not gonna allow herself to be in a position where she had to trust in anybody. And that was the same thing with the Lord. Yeah. So that, that invitation for her to walk away from that, to realize that the Lord wanted to be faithful to her, that the Lord was going to show up Right, And I think that this is really this, this invitation to radically and totally rely on the Lord and, and believe there's that scene from uh, the, the movie where he walks out on the cliff and the next step that he takes, that the Lord is actually going to be there. Mm -hmm. That's a step in faith. And, and, but what I think you continually do is remind us that the Lord is going to be there, that he is faithful, that he is our Father, mm -hmm. that he is our Savior, that he is our Redeemer, that he is going to be there. And, and, and I think it's the invitation that this, this self-reliance that I can handle this, that I can do this, is ultimately it leads to fear, it leads to chaos, it leads to confusion, it leads, and to be able to invite the Lord to be present to that. So the fact that you're able to share that with us through your own story, the step in faith, and to be able to believe and trust that the Lord is gonna be present to that is a great blessing. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So uh, maybe we just pray for that for a moment. This, we find ourselves in Lent and uh, trusting that the Lord is faithful, the Lord is present. So let's just take a moment and pray for that. Heavenly Father, as we find ourselves on the journey of Lent, allow us to walk with Jesus, trusting no matter uh, where that path goes, that he will be with us, that he won't abandon us, that he won't leave us alone, uh, that he will stop in the midst of our greatest fear and say, uh, I am here, I am with you, uh, you are not alone. Lord, may this reality become more true in our hearts, uh, more true in our lives during the season of Lent. Mother Mary, that you would uh, pray for us we ask this, Jesus, in your name. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com slash presents. You can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447. That's 800-783-6447.